Let's talk the neuroscience and psychology of greed, only here on the People Scientist Podcast. Listening to the People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on neuroscience, physiology, and nutrition. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking, to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 137, where I aim to arm us with some scientific evidence so that we can all become a little bit smarter and a little bit healthier with every new episode. How's your day going so far? Now, whether you're listening while you're commuting, while you're running errands, while you exercise, or before you fall asleep, thank you for inviting me into your day. So what topic do I have in store for us today? Well, lately I have been intrigued by the neuroscience of greed. Greed is rather a complex emotion or personality trait. Some people tend to score higher for having greed as a personality trait. So what is this emotion of greed? Is it good? Is it bad? Let's get into that, shall we? But before I do, let's get into our foregone fact where I share a scientific finding from long ago. The following incident was summarized in the Journal of Neurosurgery by Barker in 1995. All the way back in 1848, there is a very famous medical report on a case study of a man. This case study was about a a man named Phineas Gage. This incident is one of the most famous non-fatal brain wounds on record. Phineas Gage was working on the railroad in Cavendish, Vermont in 1848, and an accidental gunpowder detonation occurred, which resulted in pieces of iron being launched in different directions. A metal rod that was one meter long and about three centimeters in diameter had struck Phineas in the head. It entered his skull just below the left cheekbone and exited out the top of his head. So this iron rod went straight through his head and left a hole under his cheekbone and on top of his head. A 29-year-old physician named John Harlow was the lead physician to care for him. His initial treatment consisted of shaving the scalp, removing small bone pieces from elsewhere, and replacing these holes that were left in his head with larger pieces of bone and approximating the wound edges with strips of tape, leaving an opening for drainage. Over the next two weeks, the physician Harlow gave him a sedative for brain and nerves, which also purged the bowels, and three other purgatives, which were magnesium sulfate, calomel, and rhubarb. When a hernia cerebri developed, Harlow responded by applying silver nitrate crystals to the protruding brain and ice water to the rest of the head. Now, Gage shockingly and surprisingly had initially improved, but he did lapse again into a coma. Gage's family prepared his coffin and begged Harlow to let him pass away, but instead the physician would not give up. He boldly amputated the protruding brain fungus and laid open the skin from the exit wound to the root of the nose with scissors, draining, quote, eight ounces of ill-conditioned pus, or approximately 250 milliliters. Harlow considered that it was due in great measure to the free outlets through the skull below and above that the man, Gage, was able to survive and owed his life. So Phineas surprisingly survived this accident and lived for another 12 years. But did Phineas have any lasting effects considering that this front part of his brain, the prefrontal cortex, was greatly damaged? Although his memory was, quote, as perfect as ever, He does not estimate size or money accurately. He would not take $1,000 for a few pebbles which he took from an ancient riverbed where he was at work, end quote. 
Reports say that his demeanor changed significantly, that he became profane, coarse, and vulgar. That Gage applied to regain his former job as foreman, but his contractors, who regarded him as the most efficient and capable foreman in their employment previous to his injury, now considered that his change in mind was so marked that they could not give him his place again. His friends and acquaintances said that he was no longer Gage. So Gage soon left New England for New York City, where he joined P.T. Burnham's circus show. Then he traveled to Chile, where he drove a stagecoach. Harlow maintained some form of contact with Gage until he left for Chile for San Francisco in 1860. It was reported that Phineas died of a seizure 12 years later. Harlow, his attending physician after Phineas's death, exhumed the body and studied his skull to give us some of the information that we have today. Now, this, in- this incident of Phineas Gage was of keen interest in the new science at the time coined phrenology. Now, phrenology is the study of the size and shape of someone's head or skull as an indication to their personality. For example, it was believed that a larger front lobe indicated intelligence. Phrenologists believed that the iron rod had passed through the brain region controlling Phineas Gage's benevolence and therefore explaining his change in demeanor. So there we have it, the famous case study of Phineas Gage back in 1848, one of the most, if not the most serious, non-fatal brain injury that we have on record to date. Now let's get into the core takeaways of today's topic, the neuroscience and psychology of greed. Greed is the experience of desiring to acquire more and the dissatisfaction of never having enough. Greed is often thought as being closely correlated with money, wealth, materialism, self-interest, and power striving. Although the general feelings surrounding greed lean toward the negative, greed may also lead to some positive outcomes on society and economic growth. For example, by motivating people to complete goals and thus have a trickle-down positive effect on other people in the economy. In this episode, I provide a quiz to help us determine how high our score of greediness may be, why greed may be higher in men versus women, and what brain regions are involved in this personality trait. Keep listening on to find out more of those scientific details. The emotion or personality trait of greed has not been as extensively studied compared to other emotions and traits like anger and fear. And part of the reason is because greed is hard to quantify and define. So before we get into the details of greed, let me ask you, how do you feel about it? Do you think greed is good or do you think greed is bad? Do you think that you have greed as part of your personality trait or perhaps of someone you know? Then after this episode, let's see if your perspective has changed. So Gordon Getko said, quote, greed for lack of a better word is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the ev- essence of the evolutionary spirit. End quote. So, according to Gecko, greed is about drive, motivation, competition, and change. Another perspective on greed comes from Mahatma Gandhi quote, There is sufficiency in the world for man's need, but not for man's greed. End quote. So Gandhi is saying that the world has enough to suffice and care for everyone, but greed creates an imbalance, and that, as a result, takes away from others. So there's sufficiency in the world for man's need, but not for man's greed. So as the quotes above indicate, there are many opinions about greed, from positive to negative. The word greed originates from the old English term grade, or gradig, with cognates in a variety of other Germanic languages and it translates to meaning voracious or eager. Greed can be seen as an excessive desire or hunger. Definitions in leading dictionaries confirm this view, that greed is described as the selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is needed, a strong desire for more wealth, possessions, power, etc. than a person needs. So it appears that greed involving desire is specifically going after more than one needs, and more specifically it appears to be in the context of materialism and wealth. 
But how do we necessarily define what one person needs? If greed is about desiring more than one person needs, how do we define what that need is? And obviously that would differ from person to person as well. So that is why the concept of greed can be a very great area. Because I think the definition of what one person needs also varies. Another viewpoint is that greed is inherent to human nature, and that all of us are greedy to some extent. Greed can be an important evolutionary motive that promotes survival. People who are more more predisposed to gain and hoard as many resources as possible are argued to be better off and to have an evolutionary advantage. St. Jens in the British Journal of Psychology in 2015 aimed to define greed. The scientists had recruited 195 participants and asked the participants to list as many exemplars of greed that they could think of. And these were later coded to extract the most common features of greed. Now, only four features were mentioned by more than half the participants. They mentioned that greed involved self-interest, acquisitiveness, stinginess, and materialism. Self-interest was the most frequently mentioned feature of greed. Self-interest and egocentricism were seen as very central to this personality trait. From this study, the scientists generated a working hypothesis of greed, and that is greed is the experience of desiring to acquire more and the dissatisfaction of never having enough. It is associated with goals of materialism and feelings of envy, and it may lead to self-interested behavior and tunnel vision. Zeelandberg this year in the journal Current Opinions in Psychology talk about both the good and bad features of greed. So I've talked already a bit about the negative side of of greed. So what do they argue is the positive or the good? Well, Zeelandberg posits that what what is wrong with striving for what you long for? That greed could be considered to be an important motivation behind economic growth and prosperity that it could be good for society overall if there's economic growth and job opportunities. So what do you think? Do you think greed is part of your personality trait? How about we do a little quiz together to find out? There is a very simple test that psychologists use to identify how important or how significant greed is in one's personality trait. So let's answer these together. On a scale of 1 to 5, let's say 1 is no, I do not feel this way at all. Three in the middle would be somewhat yes, up to five, which is yes, this is absolutely true to me. So how would you score the following on a scale of one to five? Number one, I always want more. Number two, actually, I'm kind of greedy. Number three, one can never have too much money. Number four. As soon as I have acquired something, I start to think about the next thing I want. Number five, it doesn't matter how much I have, I'm never completely satisfied. Number six, my life motto is, more is better. And number seven, I cannot imagine having too many things. Now, if we were to average our scores on these seven questions, How does our score compare to other people? Well, in this study of 1,300 adult men and women, their average score over these seven questions was approximately 2.5. So was your test score higher or lower? I personally scored a 2.28, so I'm slightly below the average. It's funny, as for some of the questions, I felt, yes, this describes me in some ways because I am ambitious and I continually strive to achieve more. I really believe in self-improvement. However, I feel strongly against some of the statements like one can never have too much. So my scores tended to either be fours or ones. How did you fare in this question? And this also raises the question then, if we are ambitious, is that tied to greed? Can one be ambitious and not greedy? I think so. I think where the difference lies between ambition and greed is what our end goal is. Is our end goal to obtain money and material things? Or is the end goal self-improvement, learning, education, fitness aspirations, career goals, etc.? 
So I think another component that is important to be included in the definition of greed is what is the end goal of this ambition? If it is materialism or resources, then it could be greed. If it is self-improvement, then that could be seen as ambition, motivation, or drive. Economists who are among the biggest proponents of greed argue that greed is beneficial for others in society. Their reasoning is typically similar to why people have supported the impact of self-interest. Being greedy, just like being self-interested, is thought to lead first to the acquisition of wealth and then subsequently to more production. And this will consequently trickle down and thus have spillover benefits for society. So let's think of a real-world example. One could argue that Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, who is a billionaire, may have a positive impact on society in some ways. For example, Amazon creates jobs. It brings needed items to people's doorstep at affordable prices. It adds convenience to people's lives. Amazon exists because of Jeff Bezos' quote-unquote greed. I bet you that if he were to take this quiz, that he would probably score above the average for personality trait of greed. So did his greed lead to a positive trickle-down effect to the rest of society? I, obviously, the effect is probably negative and positive on society. But the question is, does it, is it, does it weigh more in the positive or does it weigh more in the negative? So this raises the question, what makes a person greedy? A large-scale survey among 120,000 employees found that greed was higher for people working in extractive industries, in real estate, in banking and insurance. And the trait of greed tended to be lower for those in service positions like education, healthcare, and government sectors. So this could be self-selection, bias, or these jobs could incentivize people to have more of a greedy personality type. Another factor that might be the economic situation in an individual's childhood. So several studies indicate that if children grew up rich, this actually seemed to be associated with having a higher score for greed as a personality trait. Wang and the journal Neuropsychologica in 2021 conducted a study to determine the neurobiology of greed as a personality trait. So that quiz that I just gave all of you to determine our level of greed, the scientists used this exact same quiz in their study. They also assessed impulsivity, and they also used brain imaging. So they specifically used functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, to assess brain region recruitment. The aim of this study was to determine which brain regions correlated with scores of greed and impulsivity. In this study, they included 26 men and 43 women. The first thing the scientists noted is that higher scores for greed were noted in men versus women. And this has been observed by other scientists as well in other studies. So let's think for a moment, why might that be? Why did the men tend to score higher for greed versus women? Perhaps through evolution, if we look at the acquisition of resources of food in history, women worked together to achieve acquisition of resources, whereas perhaps men were a bit more competitive and individual in their acquisition of resources, like with hunting. Perhaps that evolutionary trait persists to today. What do you think? Can you think of someone who has greed as part of their personality? Does this hold true in your life? Next, the scientists noted a strong positive association of greed with impulsivity. So individuals that tended to score higher for greed also tended to be more impulsive individuals, meaning that they may make more rash decisions quickly, that they may view their transactions more short-sighted as opposed to the long-term game. There's an old psychology experiment that scientists used to assess impulsivity in children. It's very simple. The children were shown two two marshmallows, and the scientist said to the child, do not eat these two marshmallows. If you sit here and you wait until I come back, then you can have both. Otherwise, if you cannot wait, then you can only have one marshmallow. So if the child waited for the scientist to return so that they could have both marshmallows, it indicated that they were less impulsive, that they had more of that long-sighted gain as opposed to the short-sighted gain. Next, the brain imaging analyses in this study revealed close sex-specific associations between greed 
and several cortical and subcortical brain regions. This included the nucleus accumbens, the parahippocampal gyrus, the cerebellum, and the operculum. In particular, greed was positively correlated with the nucleus accumbens, the caudate, and cerebellum in men. These brain regions happen to be involved in reward through dopamine release, as well as being involved in motivation. However, interestingly, the females were found to exhibit negative associations with these same brain regions, so it had the opposite effect in women. This suggests that perhaps greed, or the result of greed, is rewarding and very reinforcing in men, but not so much in women. Why is that? We don't quite know the answer to that yet. We don't know specifically the reason behind that. Is it because of different receptor expressions in these brain regions? Is it because of the impact of hormones on these brain regions? Is it because of a result of conditioning and growing up in society for the traditional men and women roles? We don't know. However, it's fascinating that we're seeing these sex differences in the brain in the context of greed. Wang in the journal Brain Structure and Function last year also investigated the neurobiology of greed as a personality trait. And they also viewed very similar findings as the previous study. That altered reward circuitry was implicated in having greed as part of one's personality trait. Now these brain regions that are involved in brain reward circuitry are also involved in things like nicotine use, alcohol intake, drug intake, exercise, listening to music, pleasurable things in general seem to be involved with this brain reward circuitry, hence it being called the reward pathway. So the scientists also noted that individuals exhibited smaller gray matter volume in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So what does this all really mean? Well, many studies have indicated that brain activity in this same region directly correlates with ratings of pleasantness. So the more activity in this brain region, the more others were likely to rate that that person was pleasant. This was shown by Piers and Bouchel in 2008 and in Kuhn and Gallinat in 2012. In the opposite scenario, patients with ventral medial prefrontal cortex lesions from injuries or illness exhibited large changes in personality characterized by acting shallow, self-interested, callous, lack of empathy, impulsive, and being irresponsible. That was reviewed by Schneider and Koenigs in 2017. This is interesting because these findings of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex with these changes in personality are very similar to what I had mentioned back in the foregone fact, where I talk about the injury to Phineas Gage's prefrontal cortex. This is part of the reason why we study brain regions that are involved in different emotions, because if an individual has an injury or an illness, or they've had a stroke to a particular part of the brain, that we can understand how that might be involved in their personality, their emotions, and therefore giving us a target to help bring someone back to their homeostasis or how where they were before. So that is it for today's episode, My People Scientist Army, episode 137, all about the neuroscience and psychology of greed. So what do you think? Has your perspective on the emotion of greed changed at all? How about your view of your own personality? Have you gained any new insights about yourself or other people in your life? So overall, greed appears to have a negative connotation as it seems to involve a constant desire for more, specifically in the, in the context of materialism. However, some argue that greed can spark motivation, completion of goals, and a positive trickle-down effect on the economy and society. Greed as a personality trait seems to score higher in men versus women. Greed seems to be associated with some higher levels of impulsivity, and greed seems to involve many brain regions that are involved in the brain reward pathway. And this can explain why some individuals feel the need for greed, so to speak, as it can be very reinforcing and pleasurable, seeing as it's acting on this brain reward pathway. So thank you for joining me for today's episode. If you want to message me about the topic, to check out the papers that I cite in each episode, or to buy a coffee to say thanks for the show, all the information on how to do that is in the description box to this episode. I hope that you all have a wonderful two weeks. If you are celebrating American Thanksgiving next week, then happy Thanksgiving. I am grateful for you, yes you, listening right now. And I look forward to meeting you back here for episode 138 in two weeks' time. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. 
Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates. Thank you.